Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us for the final panel of the day today. Um, all the most important people have stayed till the end, and that um, is evidenced by the uh, fine company that we have. We also have a very um, highly um, qualified panel to talk about this topic today. Um, this session is titled FinTech and a Digital Future in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and because it is the last panel of the day, I'm going to make sure that everybody is awake. So I'm going to actually be asking a question about two-thirds of the way through the panel, and you have to participate. You have to put your hand up and um, answer one of the two options that I give you. But you'll only be able to do that if you're listening very carefully throughout the panel. So um, without further ado, I will introduce these um, guests here, and then we will talk about a fintech and a digital future in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, on my left here, we have uh, Marte Brzozowski, the CEO of Perfinal. Sitting next to me here, we have Aniko Zambati, the Chief Digital of Officer from the Hungarian Central Bank. Sitting next to me on my right and on your left, we have um, Valent Fischer, the Chief Business Development Officer from Dawson. And from Germany, we have uh, Tobias Tenner, Head of Digitalization and the Association, and the Associate Director of the Association of German Banks. And so in this panel, we're going to take quite a wide approach to this topic. We're going to talk about digital assets and the future of capital markets generally in Hungary and in the region. We're going to talk about the emerging role of fintechs and how fintechs and banks are working together and what the scale and pace of innovation looks like. And finally, we're going to talk about central bank digital currencies and public digital money and the role that that plays um, in fintech in the region. My name's Chris Ostrowski. I'm the CEO of uh, the Sovereign Official Digital Association, SODA. And SODA works with technology companies and central banks as they go about their public digital money work. Um, so I'm going to start with um, Aniko, as it's very much a kind of a home game for you. And I'm going to ask you first about uh, the fintech sector and how the financial institutions in Hungary are being prepared for digitalization. Talk us through the progress that you've seen since you've been doing this role and how you see the state of play at the moment. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. So I would uh, jump back uh, to the years of 2016-17, uh, when uh, we at the central bank realized that uh, our banking sector has been operating quite expensively and quite, quite inefficiently. And so when we were looking around, uh, and we have found that uh, maybe we should do something special to speed up the digital transformation. And uh, therefore, we, we are actually the, the management of the central bank uh, set up a dedicated executive directorate for, for uh, supporting uh, the digital transformation of the incumbent financial sector and uh, to support the safe spreading of uh, fintech initiatives. So this executive directorate under my leadership uh, issued a fintech strategy uh, of the central bank, which uh, exactly highlighted the need for, for digitalization of, of the incumbents with the help of the fintechs, but uh, we didn't, didn't uh, want to uh, to set any preferences, so we also wanted the fintechs to, to be active, to approach the customers with the uh, modern, uh, convenient, uh, cheaper and uh, safer uh, uh, products. So we, we centered the customers uh, as, the, as the final objective, uh, who has uh, the selection. And actually, in this way, we wanted just to ensure that there would be incumbents uh, for, uh, for to be active in Hungary, because uh, we felt that without this push uh, from the central yeah. bank, they would uh, just uh, be outpaced with either European or global uh, financial uh, uh, service providers. And how have they responded to that? How have the incumbents responded to this, this push, this incentive? Actually, uh, this was uh, 
not uh, so easy to start the dialogue with them. And um, we, um, first and foremost, uh, started to measure the level of digitalization. So we set up our own methodology. We set up our FinTech and digitalization report. And uh, based on the findings, we uh, also issued a central bank recommendation, uh, which was aiming uh, to advise strongly <laughs> to the banks that they should set up a digital transformation strategy, adopt it at board level, and of course share it with us. And uh, so we are still following the progress uh, mm -hmm. uh, of the implementation with the yearly interviews and the discussions on, on uh, uh, what uh, they could achieve and where we can be of their help. Mm -hmm. So it's, it sounds like you, you can report some progress in this digitalization change of the landscape, but perhaps some frustration as well in, in, in perhaps how things are going. So, I mean, I will, if, if, if I may ask um, uh, Valent here in uh, the company that you work for, uh, Dawson, you can tell us a little bit about that. But this is one of the, uh, I suppose, uh, best uh, positioned organizations to work with the um, existing financial sector um, as a technology innovator. And how have you found the journey? Has it, uh, would, would you say that the incumbents are also not as active as you would want, or have you been impressed by the pace of change? Well, um, hello everyone. Uh, I am Valentin Fischer, and uh, I am from Dorsum, which is the, uh, basically, if we are seeing from the numbers, the leading fintech company here in Hungary, operating in 10 countries around. And answering the question is changing. It's changing rapidly because like five years ago, uh, we used to be a vendor. And it's not just the wording, it's the way how we work together with uh, within humans, with financial institutions. Like they want something and they are looking for not partners, but vendors to deliver that on the, on the solution and technology side. And I believe what is changing rapidly, and it's a good, good thing, and we, we also operate in the UK and the Swiss market, and uh, it's working like that for a decade now, and now it's in the region it's, it's getting the same shape, meaning that we are getting partners, and we are speaking about real partnerships with, with financial institutions. What does it mean in practice? That, that basically we, we can shape together what they want. Because in, in Dorsum, what we are doing is investment wealth management related uh, software products. Pure B2B, we work with the, with the leading financial institutions in Europe, more than 80 clients. And obviously, we, we understand the domain that we are covering, this investment wealth management domain. And, and what we can see is that the, the, the other side, basically our clients, are looking uh, for not just solution providers anymore, but end-to-end -end partners that can help understanding the problems that they are facing uh, and solve those problems. What does it mean in practice? How we work these days, we start from the very beginning uh, of solving a problem of financial institution, like doing a feasibility study together and, and doing the business case together. And then we, we set KPIs, we measure the impact of the change that we are driving together in an agile way with our, with our partners. And at the end, we can, we can also measure the, uh, the outcome. And this, this is a new way of thinking. And this is a new, new approach. And I believe that this kind of approach is also helping to, to deliver better solutions and more client-centric solutions. So this is a move from being just a vendor to a, a, an end-to-end -end partner with um, existing institutions. And do you work in the wider region as well? You spoke about the number of clients you've got in your work in Switzerland and the UK. Would you say that CE is your main region? Yeah, absolutely. So mm -hmm. basically the core market for us is obviously the Hungarian market. We are 30, almost 30 years old company, so we are, we are not a newcomer startup fintech and we're basically with all the leading banks in, in the region. Uh, but the stronghold is definitely Hungary mm -hmm. and the CE region. And they have more and more clients 
out of, of the region as well. Uh, but absolutely, the, the, the core experience that we, we have is coming from the region. Thank you. And Tobias, if I may ask you for an outsider's perspective, as <laughs> the, um, uh, someone who works for an association of German banks, how does it look like the CEE is doing from where you're sitting? We've heard about some progress here. We've heard about how fintechs and financial institutions are collaborating. Does it look like that from the outside? And how does that compare to what you see in Germany? Thank you, Chris, for this question, because I think there's one difference between the markets. Yeah. Um, if you look 12 to 15 years back to this fintech market, uh, we believe that the fintech is going to eat our lunch uh, in oh. 2020, mm -hmm. uh, 2020. And uh, we realize that's not a fact. We realize, and that's what you mentioned, is there is a partner relationship. There's a relationship, especially in the automation of processes, in the digitalization of client interfaces, but also we see in the last two years innovation in the area of distributed ledger technology, tokenization, which is more driven by fintechs as by banks. Mm -hmm. um, I think the big difference between the, um, the German market and the Hungary market is that Germany is a wider market, it's a bigger market, and if you look for some challenging banks, so like N26, mm -hmm. a Trial Republic, etc., who have to scale up quite fast the business, who wants to go or step in at first in the German market, the French market, or in the British market, either then that they would go to the Hungarian market, which is a big advantage for the Hungarian banks, because they will have not the competition with the fintechs as what we have in Germany, for example, in that manner. Uh, on the other hand, there's in Germany a big disadvantage because of this huge market and this strong competition also, that if you want to apply for a license or if you need any kind of support, and it's good what you have mentioned from your side, um, we know, for example, at the moment, if you want to get uh, a crypto uh, custodian license, uh, it needs uh, two to three years to get them. Commerzbank yesterday get them, and it's an incumbent bank. Uh, and the regulatory authorities need two years to confirm that Commerzbank could run the business of, uh, of the crypto custodian. Imagine if you were a startup uh, and if you want to run this business to convince the regulatory uh, body about your activities, it's quite more difficult. And I think there are some chances uh, from the Hungarian market to step in to show that this process could be more easy. And I think there are some good uh, war stories from Lithuania. Uh, so they ran this business more than 10 years, and that's one of the markets with the most uh, PSP licenses. On some point, it's critical because of the passporting and the trust if there the regulatory body gives the same um, security check as what we have, for example, in Germany or in France. Um, but uh, I think the chance could be usable for the Hungarian market. So, I mean, I suppose an outsider's recommendation might be to find a kind of USP, like the PSPs in Lithuania or the identity work in Estonia or some of the things where you just can have something which makes, as we see behind us, Hungary a, a regional centre. Um, that's probably something for us to, to think about. I mean, Matthew, just uh, if, if you tell us a little bit about the work that you've done with Perfinal, and is there something that you think lends itself naturally to Budapest to take that space that um, Tobias is, is describing? Yes, um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Matej Brezovski, founder of Perfinal. Perfinal is, uh, is a core banking system provider, um, and uh, in the discussion, as uh, I hear the introduction of the others, we represent the fintech side in this whole um, workshop today. Um, what uh, we have built is, uh, I mean, as a fintech, what we, we are trying to do is, uh, is to leverage the most recent technologies that uh, basically front-running the innovation and bringing in other use cases. But uh, building a fintech is, uh, is about risk. So uh, introducing new type of asset classes into existing operation or launching new services, it's always a risk. And um, regarding to just uh, reflecting on some of the topics that uh, the partners has mentioned is that uh, how I feel being a fintech in Hungary has evolved in the last uh, two or three years. But uh, I think where it evolves is that uh, fintechs are the ones who are uh, legitimately and by nature required to take a risk to experiment with, experiment with these new, new technologies because otherwise we would not be able to show something new that's already not in present at the financial operation. 
Um, so, what so, we tell us how you how it's evolved then. So how, what, what's changed, I suppose, in these in these last few years that you mentioned there. It, it was nice how Tobias mentioned that yeah. uh, a few years ago, even like five or six year, yeah. years ago, uh, the story was that fintechs are gonna uh, challenge the banks. They will take over the market and uh, uh, they are gonna uh, eat the lunch. Uh, it's important to differentiate uh, fintechs who are customer facing, like Revolut and the neo banks and other neo banks, and fintechs who are actually trying to build innovative solutions for the financial sector itself. Okay. We are in the second position, so uh, I haven't really faced the challenges of building customer-facing products yet. Yeah. But uh, when uh, we are trying to, uh, how our kind of pitch evolved during the days, that first we wanted to create a core banking system for banks who would like to replace their existing core banking system to, make, to be more efficient, to be more transparent, to be more faster in innovation. Um, I mean, in operation. Right now, we are cha changing that story. So in the last five months, we have uh, basically offered the financial institutions the, the chance to actually launch and experiment with new technologies mm -hmm. um, in a way where they don't really take too much risk. We, we, does, we do the research, we do the heavy lifting, and uh, eventually um, they can have like, a much better understanding. And this is true for the financial institutions, but this is also true for, for example, or the established technology providers who serve the banks. So they are more interested yeah. in, in our view that what's going to happen and, and what our experience when we talk about DIT technologies or even CBDC approaches. And talk us through these technologies a bit more. Are you talking about the more pioneering and innovative technologies like blockchain or are these um, better systems than what, what, what are currently there? Talk us through the, the kind of USP for Perfinal here on, in this space. Uh, yeah, in case of Perfinal, um, our USP is that we wanted to create a system that is able to uh, replicate the new type of asset structures or new kind of economic structures that are eventually brought in by the innovation and the, and the customer expectations. So, uh, for example, when you think, of, think, think back around uh, 10 years from now, that was my Revolut transfer wise launch. They offered some really easy to understand features like free transaction between, yeah. uh, between customers or free exchange of Forex between one currency to another. Um, what they have done there is that they moved uh, the actual operation into a virtual space mm -hmm. in this e-money structure, which was a world garden of, of an internal operation. So that's how they could uh, eliminate the features. But uh, how, where they evolved is that uh, the competition after a few years was about that who are the ones who can uh, introduce faster and better customer experience features because they are going to one who eventually will prevail. So there can be like three, 300 neo banks. Uh, Lithuania is a really good example. So I think in 2022, there was like 400 e-money applications pending at the Lithuanian Central Bank. I never understood what all these companies wants to do or was the competitive advantage for each of them, but uh, that was the structure which was uh, new and uh, which was more effective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Aniko, just reflecting on that, do you see the, I suppose, the space for Budapest for this, um, this to become a center where you get 400 applications for something else, like digital assets or like um, other forms of technology. Do, do, you, do you see that as a possibility and is it part of how you think about the future? So actually just mm. referring back to the yeah. selling point of Budapest and Hungary, yes. mm -hmm. so actually uh, uh, the mere fact that we are uh, at the heart of Europe, so mm -hmm. easily accessible, we have a very, uh, very wide talent base, we have mm -hmm. excellent uh, technology universities here and of course economics universities and we have a very appealing uh, tax rate of 9%, uh, which, which can also be a unique selling point. And we have a very flexible integrated regulator, so the central bank and the supervisory authority are unified, and um, so we are offering um, for the fintechs a unique platform called Innovation Hub, where they can approach us, ask, uh, ask about the licensing process, ask about the uh, regulatory uh, boundaries, uh, and uh, they can seek our opinion whether the idea fits into uh, that or, or they should revise it before uh, entering into a more formal uh, discussion with the regulator. So I think all these uh, make, make us uh, 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 an appealing uh, place to, to make business. 
and uh, just uh, to, to finish it that uh, we are a, a relatively uh, small country with uh, something like uh, uh, 9.8 million inhabitants, so we are an ideal uh, size for, for something new, so I usually say we have the perfect size being a, a regulatory sandbox or a sandbox overall. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. Yeah, That's just, right. just yeah. referring to that, uh, my experience, and basically it's coming from, from comparison with, the, with, with what, what we experience in the UK and Swiss market, is that in Hungary, if we are speaking about engineering and speaking about experts on the domain of technologies, it's outstanding. And if, if, if you look on, on the teams gathering fintechs, building good products, it's amazing. What is, what is missing is the, the capability to really bring it out of the, to bring it to the market. So this kind of building partnerships, uh, building business, this business development and sales driven mindset, this is what is missing. And what, what I can see is that several good fintechs from, from the Swiss market, from UK, from other parts of, of Europe and, and globally as well, bringing their technology hubs to Hungary. But when a team is starting something from here and, would, and, and, and want to scale, and really scale, and scale doesn't mean like 30% of growth or 50, but like triple every year, five times growth every year. This is not happening with, 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 without a very strong business development and sales-driven mindset and finding the right product market fit. And this is, this, this is what, what is lacking from the, from the market today, and I hope that, that this is something that will change. And, and about the size of the market, I, I have a theory, and maybe it's, 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 uh, it's not a good one, but I like it, um, that, that the size of a, of a country like Hungary with approximately 10 million or a bit less than 10 million people can be captive. What does it mean in practice? That you use the market as a pilot one. So if you, if you do something new, you try to sell it for Hungarian players, which is obvious as this is your home market. Uh, but what you do after that, you sell it to another Hungarian player and another one. And if you start to work for one uh, market, even if you think as this is a pilot market, it's even more difficult to scale. So if you don't start to think big, at the very, very beginning, think of Europe, think of the, of the globe, just think of one pilot market, it can be very easily sticky. And, uh, and what, 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 what I can see in several cases that after they start to, they, are, they can be successful here, and not able to really scale up as, as, as the market size is sticky. And it's not about Hungary, it's about the size of the market. In case of Germany, the market is big enough to, to grow strong just from, the, from, from one market, and then you're able to scale because the market is big enough. If you're speaking about like Estonia or Lithuania, smaller markets, you, you don't even think about starting anything with your own market. So you're basically pushed to, to go from the very beginning, Europe-wide scaling, at least. Uh, so this size of, of, of countries are having this kind of situation where fintechs and newcomers can be, can be a bit sticky. Yes, go yeah. ahead. Uh -huh. I, I think I totally agree that you have, I would call it the medium-sized country. So yeah. Estonia, etc., is a small one. Yeah. Germany, it's, it's a bigger big one. one. And, but I told also you some disadvantages that we have in this, this manner. Uh, but where I'm not agree, and, and where I'm especially in these times, I would more um, would slow down the expectations. Um, think big, it's okay. Uh, it's as well what we would think in Germany. You say think big because there are 80 uh, uh, million uh, citizens. But uh, what we see in the last 12 months is that uh, there's a lack of funding. Um, and the uh, capital burn rate increased so much in the last 18 months because of the inflation. We have seen strong increasing of interest rates, uh, which lead to the fact that you get no funding uh, and that you have to tell the real success story. And it doesn't matter if you're in the Hungarian market or the German market or whatever. So I will be a good wish to, to the whole market that we can uh, accelerate uh, in the same speed as what was happening in the last years. 
but uh, I think we would be in a good position to put down all the expectations um, uh, as long as we have this high interest rate level. I suppose if the interest rate level will be uh, decreased a little bit, there could be new success stories. But uh, the um, Association of German Banks um, uh, has also an extraordinary membership. Um, and we were the first uh, banking association in Europe who allowed fintechs to be a member, and that's now seven years ago. Um, and what I can say from the last six months, I never have seen the last year such a high reduction in reducing of memberships and banking or bankruptcy or merchant acquisition, etc. So, um, reduce the speed. I think it's for us out because uh, also from the risk perspective, uh, but fintechs are quite important for the market and the most um, important innovators for banks. Certainly. I mean, there are a few different points we've covered here. One is the actual financing of these, of, of these firms, but also the, the positioning of, of, of Hungary being um, slightly different because it's not in the Eurozone. It's not so small that it's part of a large market, but it's a sandbox on its own. So we can see some advantages here. Um, Matteo, from, you, from your point of view, I mean, do you recognize the funding point that Tobias is making there? Are we in a tech winter still? Um, in terms of how you would consider funding Perfinal, is, are, are there as many options as you would like there to be? No, not at all. Um. How, and, and <laughs> how can, uh, how can well, what can be done about that? There's obviously there's the overall climate, but is there anything practical that can be done about that? Yeah, I think uh, mm -hmm. the most uh, important and macroeconomic macro reason behind the uh, mm -hmm. fundings being um, evaporated from the market is the high interest rate climate. So that basically means that uh, money is more expensive than yeah. eventual investments are more expensive. So they are much more risk averse regarding to what and how they invest. Mm -hmm. But uh, regarding to investment and, and venture funds, the money usually goes where the story is evolving. And yeah. uh, if we are reaching back to the to the main question of the of the discussion is that. Hungary is a regional, regional economic and fintech center, uh, but for what? I think that's the main question. So what, what is going to be the story, or what can be the story in Hungary, which can ev eventually, eventually uh, become something that not just locally, not just in the, in the, um, in the region, like Central Europe, but also from uh, Europe-wide, but also from globally can be attractive. And uh, um, there are not many potential stories which you can eventually leverage to be the story. Yeah. I mean, opportunities to leverage to be the story. So um, since we already talked about Lithuania, Estonia, uh, and the e-money regulation there that came in in 2012, 13, something like that, um, the, the central bank and the, probably the whole government was strategically building Lithuania and, and Estonia as a, as a hub within Europe to approve and operate these, uh, these new type of financial institution neobanks because uh, due to the regulation they had the chance to actually serve the whole market. So from global uh, directions and uh, even after Brexit from UK, the financial institutions uh, have actually approved for licenses in these regions because they knew know how to do it. It had practice, it had uh, all the vendors and all the consultants who already know what needs to be done in order to, to launch securely an application and eventually get a license. Um, and uh, as a next story, uh, I know the cryptocurrency is also uh, approached from different uh, opinions, but, uh, but uh, as the evolving uh, markets in crypto asset regulations is going to be a, a European level uh, regulation, and uh, by anybody obtaining a license in a particular country at the National Competent Authority, they will have the chance to go for the whole European market. Um, that basically creates the same kind of narrative that has started with the e-money regulations in, in 10, 12 years ago. Yeah. So, um, and like I said, there are no many stories like that. Uh, but so just, just, yeah. uh, just one last sentence to, to praise the Central Bank of Hungary a little bit. Um, so, so that uh, kind of top-down innovation supporting approach is already has proof. So I mean, even Perfinal and the CBDC project of Hungary is a proof that it's, mm -hmm. it's working and it's, I think it's, a good example, not just locally for the commercial banks, but also globally, because in global space, the, speed, the, the innovative nature of the Central Bank of Hungary does get lots of recognition, which yes. is even good for us as a company uh, trying to go to the global market from, from Central Europe. So um, that's happening. Um, that's supportive. Even with Mika, I do know that there are many researches, many, many 
opportunities that the central bank and the regulators are working on. But uh, I don't know the exact recipe what would make Hungary a, a potential hub uh, just similar to Lithuania that happened in even elections. So maybe, maybe Aniko. Well, we'll, we'll talk about the CBDC work in, in, in a minute. I, and on this particular point of, of, of Mika, because this was passed with quite, with quite a bit of fanfare you know, earlier in the year when the, 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 the Mika regulation was gives the opportunity for banks to issue stable coins, it allows uh, a regulatory framework for crypto assets. I mean, has that had the impact that you thought it would have, Matty? Is, is it, are we in the position you thought we would be in at this point? Um, and if not, do you, do you expect that to change? We actually did a survey with uh, crypto companies uh, in Q1 2023, um, exploring their appetite towards regulation and uh, yeah. the results were uh, quite fascinating because I think uh, all the we have we have uh, talked with uh, around 45 crypto cryptocurrency mm -hmm. service providers who already operate in Europe and 60% of them are actually said that they are gonna obtain regulation within one to three years so they want to keep in the market because otherwise they have to leave yeah. so they want to keep the market yeah. they operate with European customers so so uh, the crypt on the crypto side, there is indeed uh, opportunity for regulation, but um, only the ones who have the capabilities to actually become a regulated operation, almost like a bank, are, go are, are the ones who are actually taking the steps eventually. And uh, it slowed down a little bit as far as I, as I experienced. So I, I don't really experience that. Uh, I mean, there are these good sand sandboxes, so even, even in Germany, there are like yeah. custody licenses. Uh, France had its own sandbox, so it's happening. Um, but it doesn't really have... Mm, I mean, if, 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 I, if I recall uh, a most recent conference in Dubai, uh, it was, they were really talking about regulated operations. So, uh, so it's, it's happening. The commercial side, commercial bank side, uh, they're, I think, a little bit more risk averse. Yeah. Even, yeah, sorry, even, case, more than, yeah. even more than risk averse, yeah. just uh, referring to, to Mika, which is basically a regula European level regulation yeah. on, on crypto assets for incumbents. And uh, there was a conference here in Budapest last week. It's the banking technology, basically the biggest uh, technology related banking conference of the year. And uh, I had a presentation on, on Mika and the impacts of Mika, and I started my presentation approximately 100 people in the room, and I asked them, how many of you ever heard about Mika? That it is not coming, it's here. So it's already accepted by the EU Parliament and coming in force with all the detailed regulations 2024 December here to Hungary. And I asked them, how many of you have ever heard about it? Commercial bankers, technology guys from the big banks, from like 100 people, guess how many of them? ever heard this, this word of Mika? What do you think? Five. Three. <laughs> Three people from the room. I was about to ask the audience. That was a question. <laughs> yeah. question. But no, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not even, it's, yeah. it's yeah. very, very far away from their thinking. Yeah. They don't even know that one year from mm -hmm. now, they will have the chance by regulation to basically sell Bitcoin to their clients, yeah. theoretically. They will have the chance to do that by 2024 December, and they don't even know. Yes. But, uh, but if I can jump ahead, in, yes. so, because, because I think there's one challenge, uh, and that is what we're discussing already, and uh, perhaps you know that in Germany we drove uh, the electronic security law uh, since yeah. six years, and uh, that is in, since three years in place. It was a long way, uh, but uh, I think there's one challenge, and uh, obviously you think, okay, it's Mika, and you can issue stable coins, great, you have something to sell to the clients, perfect. <laughs> yeah, but look, you have also to trade them, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice, nice place that you have a primary market, but you also need a secondary market, and that's not in place. You have the DLT pilot regime. And that's Absolutely. the right step and the right direction that the regulator is driving like a sandbox and is just trying how to um, define the best regulatory framework. But if you want to invest as a banker and don't think as an innovative bank like Revolut, just think as a Deutsche Bank, Commerzbank, Unicredit, whatever, you need absolute security about your investments, not this year, not next year, about the next 10 years. And if it's a pilot regime, it's just a pilot. So I think that's, that's a real challenge. So at first we need the Mika, the second is we need the secondary market, and the third is 
Now you have the asset on chain, you need the payment on chain. Uh, and we have the payment actually on chain. So if you want really to participate on the advantages of the distributed ledger technology, the atomic payments, the delivery versus payment, etc., then you need the whole infrastructure, asset chain, payment chain, primary market, secondary market. And I suppose if this is in place, you would not only have three persons, you would have perhaps 40 persons, not 100, yes. but yes. much more. Well, and, and, and perhaps we will, you will see that if you ask that question in subsequent years I, in Budapest. I think, I think part of the issue is also that many incumbent actors get their information through the mainstream media. It was one year ago exactly that Sam Bankman fried was arrested and, uh, and the, the whole FTX thing collapsed. I was in Dubai at the time uh, making a presentation. I had to change all my slides because he'd been arrested that <laughs> night. But then I asked a question again to a very <coughs> Who recognizes this guy? And I pointed at a picture, the picture of Sam Bankman fried on stage with Bill Clinton and Tony Blair. Not one person recognized him. And then they all started checking their phones. And they're like, oh, yes, I have heard of this guy. And then we saw the FTX logo everywhere in Dubai, <laughs> where they were sponsoring all these, all these, uh, all these events and, and so on. And of course, that has had a big impact as well. So that's also part of the macro climate for investment and for Mika and for people moving into crypto assets. So you certainly have your work cut out in the UK <laughs> if you're going to make um, Budapest a, a centre for this and if you're going to make Mika, I suppose, user-friendly at this early stage. Um, so, I mean, how do you go about this? How can you get to a point where this new form of asset class can become something real to the banks that you supervise? So actually, just mm. referring back to whether we would like uh, to, mm. to attract uh, 300 or 400 applicants for e-money license, we definitely not, because mm. we, we do believe that we have to uh, offer a, a solid uh, regulatory base and not like uh, communicating that if you are small enough, we don't even watch what you are doing because it, it can make harm to your market, to your reputation. And uh, we have also uh, read some news about uh, the uh, heightened uh, casualties for EML, KYC issues and things like that. So, so we would like to be transparent, solid, but we are there to discuss and to interpret uh, the rules which are uh, the common rules of the uh, European Union. And here, uh, just uh, coming back to the spread of the DLT-based uh, uh, business models, we also encounter uh, that uh, banks do not see the opportunity to invest huge money to, to something which uh, might be the future in 10 years or so. And therefore, uh, we are uh, pushing them a little bit. So we are informing them, we are uh, attracting them to participate in international projects like uh, cross-border CBDC uh, pilots and things like that just to, to uh, to uh, build up the skills and to have uh, uh, those uh, uh, preferably not too far from the management level who can decide on these directions. So this is what we can do. And also the other way we can uh, do is to build infrastructure and build standards because uh, we also had uh, quite a huge and they were a couple of years ago when we implemented the instant payment system as, a, as an obligatory uh, participation-based uh, system for the whole country. And so we realized that, uh, uh, that uh, we not only have to push the banks, but we also have to create some standards so that the, the new form of payment can, can be really part of the everyday payment practice. So we, we cannot let the market to, to, to um, fly as freely as, as you would think. And um, one of the things that the um, Central Bank of Hungary has done is created the um, uh, CBDC pilots, which um, we, you, you can tell us a little bit about now. Because what Tobias was saying is if you're going to have the assets on chain and if you're going to be able to invest in crypto on chain, you need to have the payments on chain. And now CBDC may or may not have anything to do with, with blockchain, but a form of digital money that allows people to access and to uh, buy and sell 
tokenized forms of value is something that's, that, 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 that's very important. So I'm going to come to a question for the audience in a, in a minute, but do you want to just tell us about how you're working on that bit and how the CBDC work is part of the wider digitalization strategy in, in Hungary? Uh, yes, with pleasure. So just um, uh, referring back to, to mm. the technology experiment uh, on, a, on a DRT based uh, framework, we, we see that we have to lead by example. So the central bank already has a blockchain based uh, uh, system uh, in, in its core, uh, core uh, um, ledger. Uh, uh, which on the one hand it's a very serious uh, experiment it's, uh, it, it was uh, our CBDC pilot uh, where uh, we are allocating NFTs to our users uh, in return for solving quizzes and these NFTs can be collected, stored, exchanged and uh, Finally, uh, they, they could be qualified for a, for a lottery and when uh, the real physical uh, set, uh, sets of coins are distributed, they can also be registered on the blockchain. So on the one hand, this is a very uh, small scale, gamified uh, uh, exercise uh, where, uh, let's say, we don't run so much credibility risk or operational risk, but on the other hand, we are preparing the central bank to, to work with the new technology. But we also have an even more serious uh, CBDC pilot. It is called uh, Digital Studentship, where we, on the one hand, uh, are targeting uh, the the age group of 8 to 14 years of uh, primary school year students, uh, and we are offering them a free digital wallet, uh, which is actually uh, 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 registered uh, in the in the um, accounts of the central bank. So it's uh, uh, operated. Uh, uh, as our CBDC uh, offering, and uh, these wallets can, of course, be uh, uh, topped up uh, with a card payment and uh, uh, with the help of the QR code uh, uh, system we uh, implemented, you can uh, pay uh, with um, pay at more than uh, 20,000 uh, merchants, and also you can uh, transfer this mm. money to anyone who has a bank account. So we want to uh, uh, incentivize the digital financial inclusion of the next generation, who anyway could be the users of uh, CBDC, but we also want to um, install our own capacities and skills and uh, processes so that the central bank could be familiar with, with what the task is, how, how wide the, the area of decisions is that we have to make, and also, of course, to, to uh, new the market, to new all the, all, all the vendors, or, or the technologies that helps us uh, to make uh, the proper decision and also have a very short implementation period when the management decides to have it in a larger scale. And, and, and this is one of the things that I think does set Hungary apart and plays into the sandbox story that you were saying is that these are actual assets that are used by actual people. I mean, the CBDC is a claim on the central bank's balance sheet and that is unusual. Um, from the work that SODA does, certainly I, I noticed, but also the actual tokens as well in, in the NFTs are actual, actually issued from the central bank's ledger and used by members of the Hungarian public, which is different from how most central banks are approaching this. Any questions from the audience? Um, if we can have a microphone, please. There's a gentleman at the front here who's got a question. Um, any others? We will ask them all now. Thank you, sir. Do you mind just saying your name and where you're from? And then? Fifty thousand people at Web Summit. 
This week, 60,000 people, probably 100,000 people go to Singapore for MAS, the regulators event, which is, which is basically the roadmap for FinTech for the next 10 years. I was in London, there's Digital Assets Summit. I spoke at an event called the FinTech Talents Festival, which had 400 speakers across open finance, embedded AI, you know, open finance, all the things. So why can't Budapest be the center for events? Because you need media, you need buzz, you need international sort of presence here. Because I don't see Warsaw or Prague or any of the others taking the mantle, but as part of it, budget for bringing people to Budapest to talk it up. That's my advice. And this is a big week for FinTech anyway. It's perhaps a challenge for OMFIF as well, who are <laughs> <laughs> hasting this as, as part of the conference. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the, the storytelling is a hugely important part of it. I mean, what I've noticed is that the storytelling it represents a real clash of cultures because if you spend any time in the crypto space, then the storytelling is the main thing. You know, look at what we've done. We've saved the world. We've created this token. I haven't we done brilliantly? And central banks is almost the opposite. It's a very kind of even-paced approach to this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing things. And um, and, and and so how do we get this right? You know, if, if you want Budapest to be a centre where people come, you need to be able to tell the story in a serious way, not in an in, in, in the kind of, with with the sort of hype type crypto events that can, um, that can sometimes backfire, as, as we've seen. I mean, Baron, you must see a lot of this as, you, um, as, as Dawson expands quickly. Um, what, what do you think is the best way to tell, to, sort of, to tell the story, I suppose, which is John's question there? It's a good question, as uh, you somehow need uh, a real ecosystem around. And, and if, if you don't have that, it's just, it's just not going to be real. And, and you, you're not going to be able to attract the right people to one place all together. So what's going on at, at very this time in Singapore, basically they, they are a hub and everyone knows that if we are speaking about that region, it's Hong Kong and Singapore and that's it. And everyone knows that. And, and if you're speaking about digital assets and crypto, it's basically uh, Zurich. If you, if you go, if you, if you wanna be somewhere where it's really happening, not faking, but the doing, it's Switzerland. And that's why it's just, it's just not feasible to do it here for even me. If I, if I want to be on the, on the highway at that topic, I go to Zurich. Because I know that the guys there, that I can meet there, they are doing this. They have real use cases, they have clients on that, they have something really on chain that is in production. And it's not about Hungary, it's, it's, it's about basically if you're not a hub and, and building a hub, I don't know the, 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 the success receipt or how, how to build a hub. But if it's not there, it's not enough to, to have an event because no one will be there. Why, why, why come here if you, if you want to know what, what's happening in the, in the fintech universe? So, but, but, but so, so actually, we are uh, in a very close relationship with the MAS. So usually we are in Singapore, we are in Zurich. We have been uh, uh, co-organizers of uh, Point Zero Forum uh, with, with the Swiss authorities and MAS. So we, we uh, had uh, uh, several uh, uh, occasions Especially in the COVID times, it was easier to set up World FinTech Festival as a satellite event of the Singapore FinTech Festival. So actually, the problem is that, uh, as I see it, that if, if those gentlemen are doing the business, they, they don't have the time and effort to, to build the network and promote uh, the ecosystem per se. So therefore, some of this work is done at the central bank, but of course, we can be successful only if we do it together. Thank you. And I, I'm, I'm going to just come back and ask a question about the German perspective. I'll also make a comment on Portugal. But this gentleman also has a question. I want to involve okay, you. So my name is Josef Zimmer. I'm uh, working for a Hungarian IT company. Uh, and I wanted to say that, of course, uh, Budapest will never take over the, uh, Singapore's role. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, but there are uh, uh, certain territories where uh, Hungary can uh, be uh, on the forefront of development. Aniko has mentioned already the instant payments. 
uh, which the first part of the project was not a classical fintech project, it was an implementation of, uh, of systems. But the second part, the instant payment 2.0, uh, is a fintech project uh, where uh, the central bank is uh, a very effective driver. Uh, there is a good gyro and <laughs> there is uh, a company, this is a Capsis company, which uh, has uh, produced the Capsis smart payment solution, which is the basis for the whole uh, solution, which makes uh, possible to initiate instant payments from whatever use cases. And uh, the pilot project for Europe, let's say, uh, is going on in Hungary, and uh, we can say that most probably by next September it will work. Uh, everyone can watch it, uh, and we are already presenting it uh, to the European Commission, to the uh, UK leading organizations, to the uh, largest payment companies in the world, and everyone uh, is looking at it, and on one side is waiting what will happen in Hungary, uh, and on the other side, they are uh, uh, looking how they can use uh, this solution. So there are parts where Budapest, uh, Budapest or Hungary can be, and the Hungarian community can uh, implement uh, a fintech type project also. Thank you. And I think the seriousness of the discussion today does actually reflect the quality of work that's going on here. The storytelling also matters. It's just, it's just a, this, this unfortunate reality that you know, showing, you know, being able to get the storytelling right is, is something. That's, uh, did you have a comment on that, Tobias? Yeah. Um, yes, because actually, you actually, actually, after you've spoken about that, can you also talk about your? You, Aniko spoke about CBDCs, and just talk about how your members, fintechs and banks, are uh, viewing a CBDC. What do they think it will be useful for? I know we're sort of squeezing a lot in, but answer the first point and then move on to that because we should talk about CBDCs. A bit, and now I will come back to you as well, Berlin. Don't worry. <laughs> we might have to overrun a bit on this panel. I think. Don't worry, gentlemen. They can see the clock ticking down. Just, just uh, give me, give me one comment to the to the, to the last yeah, last yeah, aspect, and then come to the CBDC. Of course, yeah. Because, because yeah. you're talking about <laughs> success factors uh, yeah. for fintech ecosystems yeah. or to accelerate any kind of startups and, and ideas. And uh, I think you never should forget that you need also. Uh, industry politics interest yeah. so and if you look to Switzerland if you look to UK if you look to Luxembourg yeah. um, if you look partially to Lithuania if you look to Singapore it was always driven from the politician and we have in Europe in general for the whole Europe one core problem and I'm a lobbyist and I can be to tell you several stories about the last last 10-15 years after the financial crisis the lobby of banks is still not good so the politician, it's not, it's not a topic where you can get any votes from, from any, 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 any voices, uh, votes from, from, from electors. So from that point, uh, I think that's a real issue if you want uh, to run a business. And then come over to CBDC, because there is perhaps um, some political interest to install CBDCs in Europe. Uh, and then we have, to talk, we have to differentiate if we're talking about retail CBDC and the wholesale CBDC. We have talked about wholesale CBDC and the ecosystem of digital assets, etc. I think there's clear we need some more, and the ECB is working on this one, and especially for Hungary. I think it's a, it's a chance because uh, the cross currency business to manage it with a wholesale CBDC, it is a chance to make a really counter risk, counter risk party free uh, business. Um, from the retail CBDC side, um, and I know that a number of banks are quite skeptical, I have some doubts about uh, retail CBDC. Um, we published our first paper now approximately five years ago about uh, the ECB should run a ECB a digital euro project. Uh, and the most of our banks don't understand why we published this paper. Since then we, we installed a number of, of ideas, and I think from the a geopolitical perspective, as well as from the sovereignty perspective, it's quite important that Europe has any kind of CBDC. And we could perhaps speak about a market failure uh, because API is not in place. Yes. Um, I don't want to make any finger pointing why it's not in place, but uh, the case is that we need any kind of alternative. And uh, just imagine what could be happen if Donald Trump will win once again the election in 2025. And what's happened if Donald Trump will put any defense fee 
on MasterCard and Visa card by 3% of each transaction to European. So to refinance any efforts that uh, the US is doing in Europe. So we get a strong problem. A strong problem not on the banking side. As a side, we get a strong problem on the whole economy. So from that perspective, I think we, we need a common sense in Europe, not in Hungary, not in Germany, not in France or whatever either. We need a common sense about do we need CBDCs? Yes, we need to underline our authority. The question is in which kind of role model. And that is the role model what we see at the moment from the ECB. It's not our initial idea. Our initial idea was to install like a raw material. It's the same what are you doing today with the cash. It's like you have the street and you have the car. The car is the cash and the ATM is the street. So the ECB is telling us how the paper, how the cash that we're distributing is look like, but the color of the ATM and where I want to install the ATM is just my own decision. And I think it's totally fine and, uh, to, to leave that to the market. What now the digital euro is comes with up is the ECB is delivering the car because they explain us how these digital euro should look like and they're installing also the payment world. So they install a completely new payment scheme and there's a conflict of interest because the ECB on the one hand is a supervisory of banks and now get also the competitors of banks and that I don't understand. Yeah. So, from that perspective, we, are, we get much more critical and because we had a number of other conversations on the stage and I was quite positive to the CBDC approach of, this, of the ECB, but at the moment I'm skeptical and, and hopefully the politicians with a legislative proposal what is uh, published in the summer get in the right direction that we come back to the role model and the two-tire system because that's what the market uh, finally need. There's another whole couple of panels in CBDC, but um, you've been waiting patiently to make your point. So let, make your point, and then I will ask the audience, and then we'll wrap up, okay? Just, Go on. just yeah. referring back, and don't take me wrong about how we, how we build the, the ecosystem in Europe, because it's going well. Uh, but my point was that you, you really need a high density of, of companies and people doing something that that can be a success story. And it can be like the retail CBDC, which is something unique. It can be like the instant payment, which is something unique. But you need a success story and you need a high density of, uh, of people and companies around the success story. And this is something solid that you can build on if we are speaking about the hub or ecosystem. And, and the topic itself, I think it's crucial. And, and selecting the right topic and strongly agree that after that, uh, a high, I wouldn't say pressure, but a high support from, from politicians and, and from the political landscape, including uh, really the government, but including like uh, public organizations as the national bank is crucial because this is, the, this is the next step. If you have the success story and the right people, then you need to somehow build up the defenses, the bubble around, and this is, uh, this is part of, of good policy making. Uh, and I think on the policy making side, and I am not just telling this because Aniko is here, but, uh, but, but we, are, we, are, we are okay. We are, we are doing a good job as a country. Uh, we miss those loud success stories, even if we have those as the retail CBDC and this project around the, uh, the student safe, it's a success story. I, I love that project. It's, it's amazing. But still, it's, the visibility is not high enough at that point. And this is what I mentioned at the very beginning, that this kind of business development and sales mindset, this is just something that here in Eastern Europe, this is not part of our DNA. So it's, it's more of a, of, a, of a US and UK kind of DNA. And this is something that we, we need to better understand and, 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 uh, and learn how to do it right. Well, that's certainly a challenge for us all. And I think some of the hubs that we do see, we spoke about Lisbon before, that is a political decision. Many of the people we know who work in crypto live in Lisbon because they tax them nothing. Um, that means you can have a conference whenever you want. But then Antonio Costa, just before he resigned, said he was cancelling the zero tax. So maybe that will be the last <laughs> 50,000 people summit in Lisbon if all those crypto people have to leave by the end of the year. And that's not the sort of uh, the, thing you the want. The texting, uh, yeah. texting uh, policy of crypto is quite favorable it's here as well. So, so, but so, I, but you, you also, I think, have, 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 yeah. have, have a serious approach to it. Right. I did promise to ask the audience something. We way overrun, but so I'm going to, only going to give the 
speak as a one-word answer to finish. So we didn't speak about CBDC much at all. I thought we would speak about it more. Um, who thinks, and you can define this question however you wish, please raise your hand. I'm going to give you two options. Whether you, which, which currency zone will introduce a CBDC first, wholesale or retail? I'm going to go for Hungary. I'm going to go for the Eurozone. Who thinks Hungary will be the first to introduce some kind of CBDC? Retail or? Retail or wholesale. Okay. Who thinks the Eurozone will introduce um, a, any form of CBDC before Hungary? Any time. <laughs> <laughs> Who thinks neither will introduce them at all? Any time. It was just who would who would introduce it first. Right, okay, I'm gonna, you can have a one-word answer. Who do you think will introduce the CBDC first, the Eurozone or Hungary? I brought to Hungary. Anika? <laughs> Uh, actually, we have already yes. running CBDC, but, but on a Not larger scale, uh, I, I think uh, we, we might uh, have uh, the advantage from many points of view. And I just would like to refer back to your paper, because it was about uh, setting a new platform for, for innovation. And this is probably that can be, could be really relevant for, for the digital euro and for advanced countries. And as we see, it's, uh, the design characteristics doesn't uh, really reveal this direction. Maybe we should work on it. Dylan, who will win the race to introduce CBDC? The Eurozone? Or Definitely, what? hopefully, Hungary. Definitely, hopefully, Hungary. <laughs> it's this. I, I suppose it would be Hungary because you have some pilots. I'm afraid that the US will be the first one. Interesting. Thank you all very much. <laughs>